Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to this session on the better energy solutions at the COGX platform. I am Pratik Dongre, and I lead the energy materials team at Nature Communications, an open access multidisciplinary journal from Springer Nature. Uh, before we begin, I would like to start by stressing uh, this day's importance for equality and diversity in research. Our journals at Spring and Nature are today participating in the strike for Black Lives by delaying publications for 24 hours as a show of support for the movement shared by a group of scientists calling on the research community to reflect on systemic racism and the personal and collective actions needed to address it. Together with the rest of the scientific community, we must listen, reflect, and act to end systemic racism. Nature Research was invited to curate today's content for the research stage at COGX. Our aim is to spotlight research that we think is some of the most important and exciting and interesting being submitted to us for publication and to put it into context for you. As part of Spring and Nature, our mission is to open doors to discovery. We are addressing the challenge set out in the UN's Sustainable Development Goals by finding ways to connect research to the policymakers and business leaders who need those insights to achieve such goals in improving the world and getting the next decade right. Uh, this session is uh, for the next 45 minutes where we will be discussing the clean energy initiatives with our panelists. This is followed by a 15 minute break and then we will meet again for a Q&A session for the next hour. If there are questions already and time allows, I will try to get through them. Otherwise, we will keep them for the for the next session. And I'm sure that we will have a stimulating discussion with the questions. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel for today. Today with us, we have three excellent experts to discuss the clean energy initiatives and the solutions it presents to us. So allow me to introduce Professor Christina Edstrom. Christina is a professor of inorganic chemistry at Uppsala University in Sweden. Where I also had a pleasure of spending some time as a postdoc. She's the coordinator of the large scale European research initiative, Batteries 2030 Plus. Uh, she's an elected member of uh, Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences, honorary doctor at NTNU Norway. She received the Katia Grand Prize and she's a Wellenberg Scholar. She's the scientific coordinator of the Battery Sweden and in the board of Faraday in Initiative UK. Uh, so I'm looking forward to discussing the batteries initiative and development that Christina is spearheading both in her lab and as part of different consortia. Our next panelist is uh, Jen Baker. Uh, Dr. Jen Baker is the electrochemical storage lead at for the specific consortium uh, and based at Swansea University, and where she is working on storage solutions for non-mobile applications. She holds an EPSRC, ECR fellowship, to translate processing methods from solid state photovoltaic to solid state batteries, which is a highly collaborative program. And I'm sure you all would wanna hear more about this. And for 12 years developing processing groups, to, uh, Jen has spent uh, 12 years in industries uh, developing processing routes to uh, to enable circular economy for aerospace grade titanium and brings this expertise into her research on sustainable manufacturing. So Jen's expertise uh, provides us with a great mix of details on the batteries, photovoltaics, and an industrial -like perspective from her experience out of academia. Uh, and last but not the least, our panelist is Jenny Chase. Jenny Chase is the manager of Bloomberg New Energy Finance Global Solar Insight Service she joined Bloomberg in the mid 2005 and launched the Solar Insight service in early 2006. And now she runs the team from Bloomberg's Zurich office. Jenny has conducted or overseen all the research of the Solar Insight service since 2006. Jenny's team is heavily involved in the analysis of price surveys across the photovoltaic value chain, current policies and its implications on the solar sector. Jenny is also the author of Bloomberg's quarterly photovoltaic market outlook magazine and she's also the author of a book, Solar Power Finance, without the jargon. With Jenny's vast experience in energy policies, finances, and the applications, we're looking forward to discussing the clean energy issues, an initiative that goes beyond academia and manufacturing. I can go on and on about our three panelists, but we should start discussing some exciting research and the new ideas. So without further ado, may I ask Christina to, to to just start uh, and tell us more about about uh, about her work uh, in general. Just to push before I'm there. 
here I am. Now I think I'm in business. So uh, the question for, for this and for me, uh, for this session is, can bat better batteries lead to better energy solutions? And of course, since I've done research on lithium batteries since the, uh, the mid 1990s and before that on sodium batteries, I do believe that ba better batteries are to be seen in the future and that they also can be a very important uh, key uh, for enabling what we call in Europe the Green Deal or, or uh, the UN Sustainability Goals. And I will base a little bit of my perspective and my visions on a work we have done in Europe in, in the Battery 2030 Plus uh, framework where we have recently um, launched a longer than 10 year perspective roadmap on what we think we need to do collectively in Europe to really uh, enable better batteries for the future. And uh, since this conference is also a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on, I can really tell you that digitalization will uh, also be a, a core technology to move the uh, research and development of batteries forward. And uh, there is a really a big, big interest in batteries in Europe today. And one reason is, of course, that we have had no real battery cell production in Europe, but we have many companies that need batteries for their applications. We have a no strong automotive industry, for instance. And these slides show you um, some of the visions from the um, European Commission that uh, we, we today, or 2018, we have very few electric vehicles on the road and, uh, and we have uh, some uh, sales of batteries, but we have very small share of the uh, production. And with the different uh, actions now taken at the European Commission level, with launching a European Battery Alliance, a, a industrialization uh, regional program and uh, industrialization really to, to build uh, cell production in Europe. Uh, there is a hope that we, within 10 and, and years and longer, should take a larger share of the, of the market. And that means that we also need more research. And of course, it's a question of jobs in Europe. And it's also the same actions, actually, ideas behind the Faraday Initiative in UK. And in other initiatives that you see in US and you see them in Asia as well. And that is that batteries are almost everywhere in the society. You, uh, you find them now completely driven. The development is driven by the transport sector where you have the automotives. It's going into more of ferries and also large scale um, vehicles. Uh, and even there is even some action trying to make airplanes or batteries. But of course, the large scale storage sector is also some, something that we are looking at. And I am in a very electrified country. I'm from Sweden and uh, we have a very efficient electricity grid. Still, we need more power where we have the people living and we are building some of the largest battery pack systems we have seen in Sweden for handling the situation that we need more to electricity power, for instance, in Stockholm, which is the capital. And you can see this, that you need some centralized uh, initiative, but you have also the more decentralized, where you have the solar panels, you have the house that we will discuss later, you have off solutions. So this is quite interesting development. The question is, of course, what do we need to do and what kind of batteries do we need? And um, in this roadmap, the Battery 2030 Plus roadmap, we say we, we want to suggest actions that means that we can invent the batteries of the future. And they need to be ultra high performance batteries. They have, need to have smart functionalities. We must be able to trust batteries that can have more of, of energy stored in a volume because it's a question of, of um, lifetime of a battery, state of health of a battery, it's, it's safety questions, etc. And it's very much also a question of, of um, sustainability. And we think this is important that you not only give industrial initiatives to, uh, to 
provide um, battery cell production in Europe, you also need to have a, a long-term research perspective to help the industry. So we think that is important. And we can see also that a lot of the battery research was invented in Europe, but it's produced somewhere else. And we can see that now research in this area is really becoming stronger and stronger in other areas around um, uh, Europe. That Europe is actually, we need to keep the science focus high to actually be in the front and in the global competition. So then you can uh, always ask, uh, what batteries are we talking about? And this is a messy figure, and I know this, it's a little blur. But we are today around uh, at 300, at 200, 250 uh, watt hours per kilogram for lithium ion batteries, which are the most um, strongest rechargeable batteries and the ones we have on the market. But there are other ideas and visions, and you can see that to the far end with the highest energy content per terms of volume and gravimatic capacity, you have the solid state batteries that um, uh, was mentioned in the introduction. And um, that's a holy grail to work towards uh, increasing the energy in a way that we can make it sustainable, but at the same time safe enough to really use it. Then we can really talk about batteries. But you see, still, um, compared to the existing ones, we have we are doubling, maybe tripling the capacity, even maybe four times. But to really be in, in uh, to compete with the, the energy content in in the fuel is is of course a tough thing. Um, the advantage with batteries is though that it has a very high efficiency. You are losing very little. Uh, you have an efficiency around 80-90% and if you have then a very good electric motor which has a very high efficiency of above 95%, you can actually, in that sense, uh, compete well with the combustion engine. When we do this, uh, we have to think about the whole value chain. We have to take everything into account and look at where do we have strong research and where do we have not in, in uh, to really fulfill this vision that we should be able to do better batteries in the future. And we need to make these different um, scientists in these different areas to speak together. And that's why Europe is, is forming this large-scale research initiative to try to have these discussions. And uh, what we say, if you want to really make impact quickly and advance and get better materials, you need to uh, work on Christina. any kind of... Yes. Sorry, could I interrupt you for a, uh, for a moment? Uh, I think yes. your slides are, are not moving forward after the first slide. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Jen, could I ask uh, you to, to please start your presentation while we solve the technical uh, issues with uh, Christina's uh, PowerPoint? Yes, no problem. So, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, I, I want to sort of follow on. Um, can you see the slide now that I'm sharing? We're going to bring it in in a minute. Um, so um, basically, so to further the introduction, I so I work um, for a project called Specific, which is based in South Wales as part of Swansea University. Um, and what we do there is looking at showcasing new technologies for zero carbon building. So coming from a slightly different um, angle to what Christina mentioned, we really are looking at how can buildings um, be part of particularly the UK grid, but without creating um, a further peak demand. So there's been a lot in the past when renewable energies have been brought on board, how much energy can we produce? But actually the key question really, now we're getting higher amounts of uh, renewable energy penetration, is how can we have the right amount of power that we need at the right time? Um, and so uh, we look at this from a building point of view and our work is really focused around um, supporting the grid. So as opposed to vehicle applications. However, one thing that we do find is that vehicle applications can um, lead to a support of the grid if used in the right way. So we have a hierarchy really of um of balancing um, the grid. Um, this is not just 
you know, our hierarchy, this is a sort of global uh, requirement that really the first you want to do is reduce your power demand. But the key is that then you how you can look at flexibly fitting that power demand um, to uh, the the energy generation, whether that's wind or solar, um, so that you're reducing the impact on the grid. Um, and then finally, only at that stage, do you then look at where do you use batteries to balance it? And what we're doing is looking at taking a whole systems approach to say, where is the best way to use batteries and um, how, how they can use to minimize particularly that peak 6 p.m. load that we have in the UK and also the winter um, initiate, uh, you know, winter peak in the UK. Um, so um, uh, specific and I, I think the slide, can the slide come up now? Um, I can show you some of the things that we're showcasing. So one thing, so um, these are two buildings um, that are on Swansea University Bay campus that we've built as part of um, the specific project. This smaller building was the first one that we built, which was an active classroom designed to run um, with all integrated uh, technologies. Um, so it's got um, BIPV solar on the roof, um, and it's integrated so that it stores, releases um, and generates its own power. Um, so this actually ran off grid for the first two years, but it's now attached, attached to the grid. The larger building then, so the first one was very much a demonstrator. The second building then was built through more traditional construction techniques, because the key that there is is this is not just about developing technologies in the lab, manufacturing them um, in a factory, but you need to also have the skills in order to be able to implement those technologies in buildings um, on a large scale. And so that's what the larger building and uh, subsequent work has been about, how we can scale up um, the skills and the manufacture um, of uh, integrated technologies and I think this is an area where again Christina mentioned but machine learning can come in the control systems that you use to understand you know when are you going to get your renewable power what's the best time to store it not just financially but what's the best time to store it in order to protect the lifetime of your battery um, what rate should you be storing it at so there's a huge amount to be learned not just from doing the lab work but also from doing the um, uh, general um, integration of these technologies together. How does solar work with batteries? How does that work with a heat pump? What's the best way to generate and store heat uh, from day to night? So that's a key part of the research that we're doing at Specific. Um, and what we also do is demonstrate newer technologies. So there will be a lot of talk about lithium ion on this, uh, you know, follow up questions, and that's quite appropriate. But we also demonstrate um, technologies um, such as batteries. So we're installing some flow cell batteries in um, the active classroom as soon as we're um, allowed to get back in there with COVID. And these batteries um, are not as efficient as lithium ion. And that's something that we'll do. We'll test um, the efficiency under different conditions and, and push them in a way that um, they may not be pushed in, in sort of standard use um, to understand what's the lifetime uh, costs of these batteries um, and where they might have niche um, niche applications that have been sort of thought of before. So I think um, then to sort of more details of my work as Pratik um, uh, introduced me was also looking at how we can um, manufacture batteries in different ways and this is then the link from some of the research happening in uh, solar devices how we can apply that to different applications um, and I think that's very important in research that we don't just look and focus on our one application of, of where we're driving this new technology but how that we can use um, new techniques and applications uh, across um, the range of technologies. Um, so yeah, I'd like to um, sort of probably just sum up there. So uh, 
yeah, that's that's a bit of a, a background into what we're doing in specific, and and then my my research, which again is focused very much on how um, how stationary batteries are going to split from um, vehicle batteries. In up till now, they very much have gone along parallel lines, but now vehicle batteries are wanting supercharging. I mean, when you say the so charging very quickly, heat management's an issue um uh, high energy density whereas for the grid scale storage we're now energy density is less important cost and longevity are much more important so um yeah i'm pass over to you and thanks if you've got for the questions thank, thank you jen um i guess we can move um uh, uh to christina uh, can i ask christina if you are ready I'm ready, but now I've lost my my um, presentation, so I don't really. <laughs> this this is not my day today. I'm sorry about that. Uh, could we possibly uh, um, discuss maybe the 2030 initiative? Uh, maybe I mean we're already half an hour in the in the session, so maybe we can hear yeah. a bit more from yeah. you just without the the slides, and then then we can just ask questions and discuss further. Uh, about the, the ideas and initiatives and probably the work that you have in uh, in your lab going on and also then the Q&A then more questions will come in <coughs> that way we could, we could learn a little bit more about it. Uh, the, the Battery 2030 Plus is really trying to use the new digital tools to accelerate uh, the finding of new materials and new concepts. So it's a quite uh, big ambition to um, put modelers knowing about different kinds of, of modeling from materials to, uh, to atoms, to, to battery cells, to cells in, in packs and modules in, in, a, in a row to learn from all the data we generate because we do generate a lot of data from batteries. We test them and we test them and we, we throw away so much of that data. So can we try to use that? We hope that we can learn more and, and develop better algorithms, really pinpoint for experimentalists what kind of, of materials they have to look for, for really moving forward this field. And at the same time, the experimentalist doesn't, we don't really trust the um, modelers uh, as yet. So we need to find new ways of, of screening uh, materials and battery components and cells in a better way because it's complex. You think that the battery is a simple thing. It has a negative electrode, a positive and something in between. But you have complex chemical reactions, wanted and unwanted, going on in between these uh, different. So if you change one component on one side, it, it influences the component on the other side. And do you, if you want to go for higher energy, in a battery, you you have to think about safety. You have a lot to do there. So this is a lot what this uh, program is focusing on, uh, and through sort of marry together all the facilities we have in Europe. We have fantastic uh, computing facilities. We're building Euro HPC. We have the synchrotrons. We have Diamond in UK. We have uh, in Germany. We have in Sweden. We have, uh, and we have also. Uh, neutron facilities and uh, we have also very strong and very fruitful international collaboration in this field that can really make us move forward to something that is better for the citizen you know batteries is we're talking about the energy crisis and climate crisis but you know batteries are actually helping our some of us that with medical conditions as well so we we find them everywhere already today Thank you, Christina. Uh, can we bring uh, Jenny uh, Jenny Chase uh, in this discussion? Um, Jenny, if I may have your opinion about uh, the, the two presentations our uh, panelists have given. From your perspective as an, as an analyst and someone who has a lot of experience with cost analysis and everything, how do you see, uh, say, something that Jen explained about the making the batteries, bringing them at the large scale, and uh, what Christina has also uh, mentioned, some of the challenges that, that in Europe and other, other markets that we have. How do you see from your perspective are the challenges in terms of economy, uh, 
wise and fi- and different uh, local economies, global economy wise. Also, if you could comment on the economy that would be after the, the COVID-19. So the first thing is that it's really exciting to see all this work being done. Uh, batteries have already come down really drastically in, in cost. So we tracked the average price of lithium ion battery packs and it was about $156 per kilowatt hour last year versus um, about four times as much in 2013. So it's come down by a factor of four over just five years. That's pretty amazing. And also as a market analyst, we have the ability to sit outside this and basically say, oh, it's a learning curve. Every time we double the cumulative deployment, we go down by us, we bring the cost down by a certain amount. And we can just state that as a law. Now, of course, it's not really a fundamental law. It depends on the work of people like Jen and Christina, who are figuring out how to deliver this. And But certainly this is a thing that we need for integration of large proportions of renewables. It's not the full answer to renewables, but it will certainly help. And so far, that's an application that is al- that we're almost not seeing. There's a lot of projects planned, for example, big batteries co-located with solar plants to shift some of that solar generation from the middle of the day to the evening when people want to cook dinner. But it's actually pretty embryonic so far. The vast majority of batteries deployed so far are for devices. And where even when they're stationary devices for cars and where they're stationary devices, big, sorry, stationary storage, it's pretty small and it's often for ancillary services. So it's actually just to smooth out little fluctuations in the grid, not massive, great problems with the sun being out at the wrong time. Um, But this is a thing that we're definitely going to need in the next 20 years because we're going to have a lot of solar and wind under pretty much any scenario. Solar and wind are cheap. They're probably pretty much the cheapest electricity. So we estimate that solar or wind is the cheapest electricity source in the countries representing about 2% of the world's GDP today. And that means there's going to be a lot of this stuff built. And batteries will really be needed to help us integrate those to make sure the lights don't go out and to get us from the like maybe 10 20 percent solar and wind i think denmark is the highest with 55 percent renewables in its electricity mix that's not causing problems yet but that's because denmark does it pretty well and is really well connected to the grid if we want to get above 55 percent in most countries we are going to need batteries and so i think we all really appreciate the work that Christina and Jen are doing to deliver the next cost. However, and I'm mainly a solar analyst, I've mostly focused on solar for my career, Um, and batteries are a lot more complicated than solar. But in solar, at least, the idea of highly differentiated products has not really spun out. I mean, this was a big deal 10 years ago. People were saying, oh, there's room for flexible solar panels. There's room for thin film. That pretty much didn't happen. Most of the 96% of the market solar market today is your pretty bog standard crystalline silicon panels. And I wonder if the same is going to happen with vehicle suitable lithium ion batteries, that the, the volumes being deployed in vehicles might just be so great that it pushes the cost down and they end up being what's used everywhere and I know Jen disagrees with me so she'll she'll yeah. answer that later <laughs> so I, I suppose and I'm also a bit skeptical about local manufacturing it really hasn't worked in solar it turns out the solar manufacturing is really easy so you may as well do it in big great big manufacturing hubs in Asia and so I wonder if there's much point pouring money into doing it in in Europe but I'm going to let Jen and Christina respond to that Sure, Jen, over to you. Uh. (laughs) Okay, so um, I think here is where there is um, quite a technical difference between solar um, and uh, batteries in that we think there's just lithium ion batteries in our cars. But if you bought one of the, you know, um, the lithium ion batteries are not all the same thing and they all have very different... um, chemistries at the uh, cathode side 
So the manufacturing route is the same for all of them, but the chemistry that's um, at the cathode side is in very different. Um, and so I think there will be a, a time where we actually have different chemistries to do different jobs. And I think that's the other thing that's different to solar, that solar has one job, you know, generate electricity from um, photons, whereas batteries have very different jobs. Um, some will be give me fast charging in five minutes, put as much energy um, into this car as 300 kettles at once. Other batteries have different jobs to um, charge very slowly, but to just make sure that you're saving a lot of energy for to get you through the night or to get a fortnight um, of no wind and no solar. So I think the differential will not come on cost, but it will come on the different jobs to do. And I think one area that's quite exciting at the moment is that just in fact, announcements coming out of China about lithium ion phosphate, which is an old chemistry um, compared to lithium um, nickel cobalt. Um, but China are seeing it as a way of getting a lot of um, lower cost, but longer life EV batteries into Europe. We will see in the next year if that's right. They may be quick to um, take advantage of the current subsidies that we're seeing. Um, that won't invalidate the high performance Teslas that, that want something else. But there's many different um, applications. And we've not even touched about stationary storage in that. But. Thank so, you, Jen. Yeah, Jenny, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sorry. I guess my question is, are these things going to be cheaper? And when are they going to be cheaper? Because if you're looking at a, a battery that stores energy for a fortnight, it has to be seriously cheap. Yeah. I mean, none of our so, modelling has that happening, I don't think. Lithium ion phosphate batteries are already cheaper per kilowatt hour than um, lithium nickel cobalt batteries. Um, the reason that they're not use so much in cars and they're used in all buses in China is because they don't have the same energy density and so you wouldn't get the same range and they will be heavier. So it, already the more expensive application has has pushed through because range was more important to people than cost. And this is where Tesla went. They said, we're going to make the perfect car, we don't care what it costs, and then we're going to go down. Nissan went, we're going to make an average family car that will just about get you to the shops and back. Um, nothing wrong with that. I've got one, but it, it doesn't perform like Tesla, but it's a lot cheaper. And um, obviously in the 70s, they went with cars with lead acid batteries, which were really cheap. Uh, but they obviously uh, that scenario didn't didn't work so well because they were very heavy and very low range and low lifetime. So. Could I get uh, Christina's thoughts on this one? Christina, you, you're also um, uh, talking to other experts, both in industries and academia. No, no but this, yeah. I think this is a very question, important question. Is it, um, yes, is it smart to have it as it is? All the big production is done in Asia and we don't have production in Europe. And I think that is actually very much a, a political and safety issue problem. It, especially in a period when we foresee, and I don't know if any will agree, that the need for batteries will increase quite rapidly. Will there then be space enough for the European companies to have access to cells to really bring out the newest technologies? That's one question. Then I think, um, but <laughs> Jenny, <laughs> the other Jenny brought up. Uh, uh, where, where we have differentiation of, of different battery chemistries is really very true because this is is this both a geo geopolitical question, it's a safety question, it's a range question, and a cost question. I don't think you can only talk about cost. It's not that simple because it depends on what you get. And you say, well, people go generally only for cost. Well, yeah, but we have to provide the other things too because otherwise... It won't work. And uh, yes, energy is worked. It's actually an older chemistry with an uh, iron phosphate, but it's newer in, in commercial applications. Yeah. 
And um, it's very much also a safety question because lithium iron phosphate, yes, it's a bit heavier. You don't get the same range, but you get something you can trust safety-wise a little bit better. So it, it, it really shows the complexity. Lithium ion battery is not one battery. It's a family of different chemistries. And that's really important when you make your estimates about this. Sure, we have talked about this uh, a little bit on the affordabilities and how the different economies are, are, are reacting to the developments. Um, as, as we know that this field is very fast paced, and I myself, I oversee a lot of papers and papers are changing, the, the, the performances matrices are changing every six months. So in, in terms of time scale of development of the batteries, um, how can, uh, maybe I can start with, uh, with Jen, uh, how do you see that this this whole um, the battery development is changing, say from month to month or in six months or after one year? How do you how do you see that? Yeah, th that's a big question, um, and I think within uh, I think a lot looks at you know policy will be uh, is key on that, um, and I think. Um, so we've seen already that electric car subsidies in China have, have been removed. And so those companies are looking at how can they exploit the Western markets. Um, in terms of getting new, totally new. So, I mean, we talk about lithium ion, but actually the factory just puts a different pace down when they're making a different, you know, I'm being a bit um, liberal with that there, but um you know you can you can use similar facilities and similar understandings of how you manufacture them um whereas if we start talking about some of the more exciting developments like things like lithium air where you effectively can remove um you know half half of the battery or um solid state or flow cells those things take a lot longer, to, you know, can take a lot longer to get to commercialization. And this is a point Jenny and myself have discussed sort of um, in the past that if you have a new, um, a new way of making something, it is very hard to break into that new market because your initial factory is quite small. And so it doesn't, it can never be cost competitive, even if you're using really cheap materials and really cheap manufacturing technologies, because you're just too small to compete on the cost side. And so that's where there's a very um, difficult thing for sort of new architectures, I would say, rather than chemistries to break into established markets. And there they really need a niche where they can go for that say, well, this is, um, a niche market that um, I can build my manufacturing capability, I can prove that I can make them without getting 50% reject rate. And then once I've developed that on a small scale for my niche market, I can then move on to something bigger. So those sorts of developments are maybe 15 years away, but the, the new lithium ion chemistries, I mean, I'm seeing daily, um, maybe not quite daily, but the car chemistries and, and what the vehicle manufacturers choose to go with from a huge range of lithium ion technologies. Um, you know, they, they do have quite a palette there and, and I think it will be interesting to see which ones win out. So Jenny, if I, if I continue the conversation and, and if I bring you in on this and uh, what are the policy makers like, patience wise in terms of timeline when we talk about the battery development and its transition from the research in academia versus industry and then the funders or the policy makers they have been seeing the field evolving and developing and then it's, it's very dynamic as we all know do you think that they uh, they are still willing to go and see another decade and how this field is evolving and the, the way the, the field is changing so fast how, how are the overall their the, uh, the responses so i think policymakers are quite simple souls and i admit i'm largely talking about like deployment side policy rather than research side i'm both other panelists would know better than me about how research dollars or research euros are allocated um but on the policy side policymakers do not care they what they they don't pick winners. They will say, look, build electric vehicles. The German scrappage scheme will encourage Germans to go and buy new EVs. The German residential solar scheme 
encourages people to go and buy residential storage system systems. But they don't really care about the technology. So it does come down to what people, what, what gets to market, what is priced well, what doesn't have a massive mess up. I mean, Korea has had some, the Korean market really shrunk last year. Korea is one of the largest um, stationary storage markets in the world, and it really shrunk last year because there were 28 fires involving some forms of lithium ion batteries, and nobody knows why, which is a little bit awkward. And it's probably something to do with installation rather than um, the actual technology. But it's, you need to have something that doesn't have setbacks. And so far, yes, so no setbacks, performs, gets a good reputation, brings the cost down. And it feels like there are still some front runners in terms of what supplies electric vehicles. And I, I certainly I'm not aware of the differentiation between them. But we're pretty optimistic that the European Commission stimulus package will include something for electric vehicles in general. Um, there are various, nothing's coming out of the US in terms of stimulus so far. Or China, I believe, that affects batteries. Japan has implemented a change to the solar subsidy, which will favour residential storage systems connected to, to solar. But basically, policymakers are putting money into it. And in fact, in my opinion, it's great that they're reallocating subsidy from solar, which doesn't need it anymore, to storage, where there is lots of interesting questions to be answered, including like, does this even make sense at all? But they're not picking winners. And that's not really policymakers' job. It's the industries, it's the research people's job to offer the technologies industry's job to pick it up and make it cheap and get the manufacturing going and then it's the policies make makers job to create an environment where it can sell perfect uh, so uh, in terms of overall um, comment uh, Christina you have um, you have heard about the support that there is support from the policymakers um, do you think that in research labs this is overall we have the capabilities to support the industries and the, the goals set out by the policymakers. Um, if you could conclude with, uh, closing, uh, with, with some closing remarks for this session. And the researchers that we have in Europe, I do think that if I look at the Asian companies, they have much more of, of research um, sort of um, they're picking, cherry picking the best results that they think can influence their applications. I don't see that in the same way in Europe. I think we need more of this bridging uh, kind of, of programs. Uh, and uh, I come, of course, from a country where we always are on top in this innovate, innovative countries competition in the world. But, and we have these schemes and I don't really see that so cl clearly in Europe. I know Faraday is struggling with that too, um, but um, I think there is a greater awareness. I think also the some of the policy uh, actions taken in Europe will actually influence the whole world. It influences that we have a new battery directive, that we have a sort of legislation on how much carbon dioxide emissions you have. This kind of legislation is, will also influence the market. Uh, the U.S. people says that for the automotive industry, they are looking at Europe because they want to sell the, the cars in Europe. So if they don't have that in, in U.S., they ha we have it and push that in Europe. So yeah, I think it's complex. I, I don't really agree completely with this picture that policymakers doesn't, they don't care. They, they do care about some kind of ways to show that they contribute to, to a climate neutral Europe. I think they do that. Perfect. So thank you, everyone. This brings us to uh, the end of this uh, session. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, lots of ideas, lots of agreements, a lot of disagreements, which we all love about uh, about science and scientists. Um, so when we come back, we have a lot more questions uh, on different issues, safety issues, and also some questions from our viewers. Uh, thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.